it was happening so systematically that one day there was one thing, the next day was something else. By the time you turn it up, there was no going back and there's no going forward. My mother took me up to the gates of the ghetto. That's when I said goodbye to her. And she said, go, my son, go. Go, he says. And uh, we cried. We... Anyway, that's the way it was. And we parted, we said our goodbyes. She made sure I got everything with me. You know, she told me she put uh, in the suitcase, she put underwear, she put shirts, she put this, put that, you know, like a mother. And uh, that was our last moments. I know she would kiss me in the eyes and the cheeks. So you know, it's a funny thing. I have dreamt about my father many times over the years. I have never dreamt about my mother. I never dreamt about my mother. I don't know why. My parents had prepared for my bar mitzvah, but unfortunately, when the war started, my father got drafted in the Polish army. He was only 39 years old. They didn't put him in the front lines, but he was carrying ammunition to the front lines. And somehow during bombardment, he was wounded and he lost a leg. When they formed, they formed the border on the, on the river Bug. And my father was on the Russian side and we lived on the, under the German occupation. And since he was in the hospital, he couldn't travel back, with, especially with, no, with one leg, he couldn't come back. So my mother decided for a fee, you could get smugglers that would bring you across the river back to her hometown. As little money we had left at that time, she took the money and, and she brought my father back home. They made people move to certain designated areas so people that lived in a better section of the city had to move, had to leave all their furniture, whatever was behind, and move into the designated area that they wanted you to be. And then eventually that would become a ghetto. Our house was right at the confines of the section that they're going to be designated as a ghetto. So we didn't have to move. So we, we, were, we were lucky in that respect. But when there was a lot of people coming in from different parts of the country, and they had to have, they had to have housing. So we had to accept one of the families to live with us. What we used to do when the soldiers used to come from the front line, we used to take their clothing and we used to search it. 
and we used to find bullets, uh, hand grenades, sometimes small missiles. The soldiers used to take for souvenirs, you know, from the Russian front. And uh, this is what was our job, put the stuff into disinfection, after a while take it out, sort it, and if they had a name on it, we had to deliver it to the soldiers. We had three German soldiers. There was two officers and one regular soldier. I even remember the names. One of them in particular took a liking to me. First of all, I didn't look Jewish. And after working for the Germans for a while, I picked up the language very good. I, I spoke German fluent. And he kind of liked me. And we got to talking, and he was telling me that uh, he's married, his wife is uh, from Frankfurt, and uh, they have no children, and he would like, to, if you could possibly, send me to Germany and maybe wait out the war, and then after the war, he would adopt me. He said he would like to talk to my parents. So one day, he took me home, and he met with my father, and they were talking. And my father told him at the time, he says, look, he says, all you're doing is you're going to be endangering yourself, endangering us. And uh, he would advise him not to do anything. You know? And that's the way we left it. You know? So nothing came out of it. But when I was working there, I didn't have to wear a Jewish star. Whenever you left the ghetto with a permit to go to work, you had to wear an armband. That identifies you as a Jew. Couldn't walk on the sidewalk, you had to walk on the street. They made a rule that if you walked by and you had to, uh, uh, and you saw some German soldiers, for instance, going by, you had to take off the hat to them. And they would find somebody, an older person with a, with a beard, they would make him dance, or they would take a cigarette lighter, and they would sing his beard, you know. To them, it was a big fun, you know, it was big fun. If you looked at the German, you looked him in the eye, just to look up to him, you got a beating. I mean, you, you could not show any emotion, period. You were just a zombie. I was walking down the street one day, and an army truck went by, and he stopped. And a bunch of soldiers came out of the truck, and they cordoned off a certain section of the streets. And uh, I was hit with a whip at the time. And uh, we got loaded on the trucks, and they took us to walk. And we were doing, like, shoveling snow, uh, unloading uh, wagons, anything that is was for the German army. One of my uncles, they lived down the street. He was over by his sister-in-law. It so happened that turned late, they were playing cards or whatever, so he decided to stay over. And uh, that night, they had patrols, and they found that he does not belong to this address. They took him out, they shot him right there and then. There was uh, seven people from that building that I took out and shot him. And that was my first encounter with that that I could remember. Our city was divided, two ghettos. And what they did, they set up machine guns, they killed them, they were killing people indiscriminately. That night, over a thousand people were shot right there and then. And the rest of them were taken to the wagons. To the, they put them in cattle cars, and they were shipped. My grandmother, she disappeared for that time. We never found her. So now, those planes were, were loaded up, and they were sent to Treblinka which was the extermination camp. They would make all the people get out of the trains. Kids to one side, men to the other side. Get undressed, and there was, they had big signs that says, 
you go into a shower. They had dogs trained that when the people are running naked, they would agitate the dogs and they would go for the, and the men, they would go to the genitals. And for women, they would go into the breasts to rip them apart. They created such a terror that everybody was running, you know. Now, myself and my sister, we got separated. Because they had to go on one line and I had to go on the other line. That was the last time I've seen my, my sisters. Commandant was a Jewish commandant from that camp. He had his family there. They took the mother and they took the two kids and they shot them. You know, and I was watching that through the wires. My uncle, he was afraid that they were going to take him too. So whatever he had, like uh, he had gold watch and he had some rings and so on, he gave it to me and he said to me, he says, try to save yourself. We cut the wires at night, and we ran. They had the Ukrainian guard, it was very cold, and they shot afterward, and I was hit in here. I had high boots, so it was a, f a flesh wound, it wasn't, wasn't much. And we came to a farmer's that he, that other guy had prearranged. We were there three days, they took away everything from us. I mean, they cleaned us out, whatever we had, the valuables and they threatened us, if we don't leave the farm, they're gonna call the German police. And so we ran away. So now we had nowhere to go. So I came back to the ghetto. And when I came to, to, the, to the gate, I couldn't get in. Because whoever goes out, if there's 10 people go out, 10 people have to come back in. So I was walking, for a few hours, and then I finally found a group of people that are going back from work. So I joined, they saw me, so that I joined with them. And when he counted, I was, he was one, one too many. So anyway, they caught up with me. So they put me in a little, in a little wagon. The wagon was, uh, they had a coffin inside there, it was all bloody. They send us to a camp by the name of Majdanek. It was a very, very bad camp. First of all, they gave us wooden shoes. They took away the, the, good, the regular shoes, and they gave us those shoes. If somebody has a big foot, they got a small shoe. They got a small shoe, got a big foot. Oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. Every morning, early in the morning, we had to run out whether you're dressed or not, run out and stay on the appeal pla uh, place and, uh, you know, and wait until the German officer decides to come out. And when he did come out, he had to be counted, see how many people survived, how many people died. We had nothing to wear. We had, if you ever seen those striped uniforms, you know, they were just made out of cotton. It was a pull up really. And you had a hat, and you had a, a little jacket, and that's all you wore. So people used to drop like uh, like crazy, you know. Uh, they just forced to death. And uh, sometimes you went in the back, you slept next to somebody, you walk up, he was dead. There was many times I walk up and people were dead next to me. The camp was divided into five different areas. The number one was Russian prisoners, prisoners of war. The second one was women. The third one was us. The fourth was crematoriums. And the fifth field was where they had all the, all the clothing, everything else. And that's where there used to be the warehouses. Our uh, barracks, they used to be where they used to live some uh, German people, you know, they, they used to keep them separate. 
you know, there were homosexuals, there were criminals, there were different uh, insignias, you know, all kinds of political, uh, you know, they all lived together, you know. So they killed their own people. If you were mentally incapacitated, you know, they, they would gas you, they would kill you. We had the first field, so to speak, of was Russian soldiers, prisoners of war. They were so mistreated. I'm telling you, they were worse off than we were. Unbelievable. I've seen uh, one row of people staying in the uh, staying in line, and they would take out every tenth person, shoot them. The German officers said not to raise bullets on these kids, just take them by the feet and smash them against the wall. The sword was always over your head. You didn't have a chance. If you ran into the Polish area, uh, they were promised two pounds of sugar for every Jew that they turned in. They didn't care. The world did not care. Then they sent us to another camp as the Russians' front was getting closer. My uncle was with me and my aunt was, was in the same camp. But when I got there, they put us in quarantine because of diseases. They wanted to make sure we have no diseases. And I contracted typhus. So they put me in an infirmary. And that night, when my crisis was at its highest, they were taking out all the people from there and they killed them. From the infirmary, I could see where they, they were shooting the people. They were what they call they called it Huyava Gurka, you know. That was the name that they gave it. And I could see, like every day, they used to bring in people, like women and kids. They were hiding in the Polish area with false IDs. They used to take them down there and they used to shoot them. And I remember the following day, my aunt was by the door and she was telling me that they took my uncle and they shot him because he was skinny and he didn't shave. So they took him out and they shot him. Then they shipped us to Mauthausen. I remember they, they had us put in you front to the back of the next one. We, was, we couldn't lay down. We were just sitting a whole night like this. Just sitting there like this. If you moved, if you moved, if you made one sound, or somebody with a big whip, you know. And sometimes at the railroad stations, they opened up the doors to take out. Uh, we had buckets for if you had the human functions, we had to go. They used buckets, you know, and it smelled. So they used to open the doors and we used to take it out. So once in a while, the local people would throw apples or something, you know, to us. And we used to go. I caught one one time. There was one man, he was a big guy, and he was a neighbor of ours. We knew me since I was a kid. He took it away from me. And he says, you're a Muslim man, he says. You wouldn't survive that anyway. i never forget that. You wouldn't survive that anyway. I could hardly walk. Mauthausen is a camp that is located way up on the top. It was hot. You didn't get no food or nothing. You didn't get no water or nothing. People would drop like, like flies. Then they shipped us to a camp by the name of Melk. And we were assigned to work on uh, 
tunnels. The tunnels, first they made, they made a skeleton, then they pumped cement up to a certain height. Then the cement, after the cement was filled up to as far as they could go, used to leave a hollow spot in there. It had to be filled in with sand. So they used to take young men, young boys, and put them in there. We had a hose with some air so you can get air. But we had cavens. So if you had a cave in there, there was no there was no end. There's a lot of a lot of kids that were caved in and they stayed there. But the camp commander, he was an SS. He was a son of a bitch. Uh, they used to met out punishments uh, left and right. A lot of times we would find some pieces of cement sacks, you know, from the cement, paper, and we would wrap it around ourselves and then put the jacket over it, you know. That's the only thing we had to keep us warm. And, uh, but a lot of times when the Germans found out what we're doing, they called us sabotage. So a lot of them would get quite a big beatings to stop that practice. And another thing that was happening, you see there was a lot of cement left on those bags. So when you put it on yourself, and then you get wet, you know what your body looked like. It was terrible. I, I, I didn't, I tried it once and I stopped it, I didn't do that. Then one day, I remember like today, we heard, yeah, we heard two, two tanks coming down the road. Anyway, they broke up in the gates and they came in, they threw cigarettes, chocolate. And that was that. Anyway, we didn't stay in the camp very long. And I started out, I didn't know where I'm going, to be honest with you. But we kept going as far away as we could. I remember we, there was another Polish fellow that I met on the road, and we walked together. We walked into a farm, and we asked for some food. And he gave us food. I asked if they give us some clothes, because we were still wearing those, uh, or, you know, uniforms. So they did. Then he's trying to tell me that they didn't know that what was going on, they didn't know this, and they didn't know that. And I remember saying to him, I says, you mean to tell me you are about five miles from the camp and thousands of people, that, that camp hold over 20,000 people. I says, you mean to tell me you did not see those transports coming in and out every day, people going to work every No, we didn't know, we didn't, you know, no, everybody mind their own business, you know. They didn't know. Anyway, we kept walking. I remember we walked in into a little town, and uh, there was a bank, it was all open. We walked in and there was, I don't know how much money there was laying around, I mean, German money. And we thought, who needs the money? You know, it's no good anyway. Germany is, is kaput. You know, we don't need the money. So we didn't take anything. We just kept going.
Okay? Thank you.